Um, so my name is Ron Pinoni. I'm a uh, lawyer in the class actions group um, at Siskins uh, here in Toronto. Um, I also uh, am an adjunct professor here at U of T and at Osgood. Um, but I went to Osgood, so you know where my loyalties lie in, in that rivalry. Um, and I will introduce uh, the panelists. Um, Arnold Schweisberg is a lawyer who specializes in sophisticated commercial litigation, including judicial reviews of jurisdictional excesses of regulatory agencies and tribunals. He has appeared at all levels um, of the interior courts and at the federal courts trial and appeal divisions and in the Supreme Court of Canada. In particular, he is Canada's top liquor regulatory lawyer and its preeminent jewelry, fine art, cash in transit and specie insurance defense litigator. Arnold has recently been lead counsel in Regina and Como, a Canadian constitutional challenge uh, about liquor laws, um, which made front page news domestically and internationally in August of last year and will form uh, a central part of this panel. Um, but not many of you may know that Arnold is also an accomplished musician and producer and founder uh, of a jazz festival. And to Arnold's left is Ian Blue, Queen's Counsel, a senior counsel and advisor on complex energy, electricity, and environmental law matters that have administrative law, business law, and constitutional law issues. He acts for both private sector and public sector clients. He has appeared before all levels of court in Ontario, Alberta, and Nova Scotia, the Yukon, and before both levels of federal court and the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, as well as National Energy Board, um, Ontario and New Brunswick Energy and Utilities Board, and before arbitration panels and other regulatory bodies. Mr. Blue is also a prolific legal writer uh, and speaker on legal topics, uh, and he contributes to various lawyers' publications, and his publications on this topic um, will be discussed today, and I will quote from them in, in my question. So uh, without much further ado, I will invite the speakers for some introductory remarks, and we'll start with Ian. And as my bio indicates, I have done some energy law, and every energy lawyer knows about Section 121 of the Constitution. It's up there. It says, all articles of the growth produce or manufacture or any of the pro one of the provinces shall from and after the Union be admitted free into each of the other provinces. Well, in the midst of an energy arbitration between Bruce Power and British Energy, I had lunch with Arnie. Arnie, who I've known for 20 years. And Arnie said, Ian, I got this problem. I've got a wine, or wine seller, and he's required to sell his wine to the Provincial Liquor Board under this obscure statute called the Importation of Intoxicating Liquors Act. And I uh, so sort of um, swallowed a bite of my hamburger and said, but that's contrary to Section 121 of the Constitution Act. And that became a mind worm. So I started looking at Section 121 of the Constitution Act a bit more carefully than I had in doing uh, natural gas sales across provinces and electricity sales across provinces. And I looked at it and I found out that um, Section 121 doesn't mean all goods and uh, uh, items of produce and manufacture shall be admitted free. What it means instead is that provinces cannot establish customs posts at the provincial border. Now, when you read that, do you get that out of that section? No. I'm a simple fellow. I uh, have a view that uh, words of the Constitution should mean what they say. So I went to the Supreme Court of Canada's jurisprudence um, <clears throat> in uh, the 2000s and said, how do you interpret a provision of the Constitution? Well, you look at the wording, the court said. You look at the legislative history, the court said. You look at the you look at you look at the, the scheme of the act, and you look at the legislative context. Well, I did that, and this is two years of nights and weekends. I'm telling you, and what I found was that at the time of Confederation, there was a tremendous preoccupation for, about free trade, and one of the main reasons for Confederation was complete free trade among the provinces. I looked at the wording. And I looked at the meaning of free in Dr. Johnson's dictionary in the Oxford English Dictionary, and free means free, no restrictions. I looked at the scheme of the Act, and uh, Section 121 is in Part 8 of the BNA Act, dealing with all matters financial uh, in the, in the uh, 
Constitution Act. And I looked at the legislative context and found that this section had been added as an amendment in the House of Commons of Great Britain to a draft that had started as in the House of Lords. So it was very intentional. And I learned that it had been drafted by Frank Riley, who had worked with Sir John A. Macdonald. And I concluded that it was an important section and that it was a restriction being put in the act on the ability of the federal government and the provincial governments to manipulate the system so to frustrate free trade. That's what a plain reading using the Supreme Court of Canada's principles um, of interpretation led me to. Then I found that the reason that it meant no customs borders, no customs posts at the provincial borders came from a case in 1920, almost 100 years ago, called Gold Seal Limited versus the Attorney General of Alberta <coughs> and Dominion Express. And in that case, uh, it had nothing to do with Section 121. Strangely enough, it had um, dealt with a messed up effort by the federal government to impose the then Canada Temperance Act in the province of Alberta. The law said they had to name the day uh, and the proclamation that would come into force. They did not do that. So Gold Seal went to court on that basis. I looked at all the factums um, of the various parties in the Supreme Court of Canada. Not one mention of Section 121. And um, so I concluded that maybe Section 121 was something thought of orally um, by counsel during the oral argument. And we all know how well new arguments, not in our factums, fare when they're brought up for the first time in court. They're not given a lot of, they're not given a lot of weight. So I concluded that the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, the three judges to spoken 121 very summarily, simply were dealing with uh, loose end and they dealt with it um, summarily and it wasn't really a judicial finding on section 121. Uh, I noted that the Gold Seal case was followed in three other cases um, in 1947, 1954, and 19. 74, that's it. No other jurisprudence considered Section 121. So I said, well, uh, that was, that wasn't a real judicial determination. We can, under the new principles, argue it. And I put that in a paper called um, On the Rocks. That had to do with the Importation of Intoxicating Liquors Act. Then I was reading the biography of Mr. Justice Duff. And I came to a page that said, that Mr. Justice Duff, who um, uh, fiddled with politics and uh, did a lot of other things that judges don't do, used to like to write to the uh, Lord Chancellor in Great Britain to talk to him about how bad things were in Canada. And in a letter called the Duff Letter, um, and Arnie's put it up here, we got this from Archives Canada, we have a copy of the letter. Mr. Justice Duff said, that in the Gold Seal case, the one I'm talking about, between the time it was argued and before a judgment came out, the Minister of Justice, who had been responsible for the messed up proclamation of the Canada Temperance Act, invited Mr. Justice Anglin and um, another uh, couple of the judges to a meeting. Uh, we assume this was a lunch at the Rideau Club, but in the meeting, um, Justice Minister Doherty asked the three Supreme Court judges how the votes were going to go on the Gold Seal case. They took, and they told him. As a result of that, a week later, a week later, there's a new bill passed in, uh, the, by the Union government called the Proclamation Validation Act, which um, said that the proclamation was valid despite the fact it did not have a date. The Supreme Court <coughs> called counsel back because of the Proclamation Validation Act and asked, what do you say about that? And they went, blah, 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 blah. what can we say? So uh, the case was decided against them. The judges never disclosed that meeting to counsel. They never disclosed that meeting to the public. In each of their biographies, none of them mention it. And that tells me that this, 
that having told the um, Minister of Justice what it would take to, for him to win the case, they weren't going to let some pointy-headed Section 121 argument stand in their way. So I submit, and I, I say this is the case, that this was, um, th this was an expedient decision. That's as polite as I can put it. It was an expedient decision. It had nothing to do with the merits of the Section 121 argument. So that led, um, I put that in a paper called Long Overdue uh, about Section 121. And um, <coughs> we talked to a lot of um, wine companies and a lot of liquor interests in Canada about whether they wanted Section 121. And uh, their response is, uh, oh, we, didn't want, we wouldn't want to make waves. You, don't want to, you, don't, you do not want to um, annoy the liquor regulators. Sorry. Sorry. So we were looking for a case, and the case that came up was Regina versus Camo. Uh, 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 Mr. Camo, as Irony will tell you, simply bought some beer in Quebec where it's half the price it is in New Brunswick, drove it across to New Brunswick, and was stopped by the Mounties and charged with a, uh, an offense contrary to Section 134.1b um, of the uh, New Brunswick Liquor Control Act, having possession of liquor that was not purchased in the province. And at that point, Marnie called me, and we worked on it. And um, then I called Arnie because, having written on the papers, I would be seen to be arguing too much my own my own legal uh, opinion and uh, trying to be an expert witness and lawyer at the same time. So Arnie did the case. So over to you, Arnie. So what, what did our friend Gerard do that was so terrible? He brought beer in from the province of Quebec to the province of New Brunswick. And I just want you to appreciate for a moment what it is we're talking about here. So I took this photo from a beer store called Wise Oats which is on the Quebec side of the New Brunswick-Quebec border. A little place called Pointe à la Croix. Sorry, I'm not supposed to be in slideshow mode here. But I want you to appreciate from this photograph the proximity that we're talking about here. The other side of the bridge is Campbellton. Campbellton, New Brunswick. So what the RCMP had done in this case is they set up a sting. They had a contingent of plainclothes officers on the Wise Out side, on the Quebec side, watching to see if any vehicle with a New Brunswick plate put liquor in their car and head up towards the bridge. And if they did, they would radio ahead to the RCMP waiting on the New Brunswick side of the border to pull that individual over, confiscate all of their liquor, even the liquor that was legal under the New Brunswick statute. They took it all away and they wrote up a, a provincial offense charge for $292. They did this 17 times that day. They have not before or since ever done anything like it. Yet in New Brunswick, the beer run to Quebec is so commonplace that the Crown agreed to put it in their statement of facts. And why is it so commonplace? Because in New Brunswick, the beer is $45, and in Quebec, the beer is $25. And I'm not telling tales out of school to say that New Brunswick is not an economically privileged place. So for a lot of people in New Brunswick, it is worth a half day of their time and a tank of gas to drive to Quebec to do a beer run, and tens of thousands of New Brunswickers do it on a regular basis. So how can we interpret provincial law, putting aside the valid constitutional argument for a moment, how can we interpret provincial law in such a way as to make criminals out of everyday Canadians going about with their normal lives? And that in part is the thrust of Section 121 because so much of the fabric of Canadian society revolves around dealing with all these various different kinds of interprovincial trade borders, some of them obvious, some of them not so obvious. So apart from the facts of the Como case, what's really the case about? Beyond the facts, the case is about determining if at some point in the history of our country there was a mistake made by disregarding or misinterpreting Section 121 of the DNA. How could it be that in contemporary life, 
the sovereign states of the European Union have freer trade than the provinces of Canada. How can that be? And I argued it's because somewhere along the way we lost the path. And this case is about going back and finding out where we lost our way and setting ourselves onto the correct path. And I was very proud when the Toronto Star quoted me on that because that really is what the case is about. And Ian has, I believe, identified where we went wrong. We went wrong with the gold seal case. When the BNA Act says that the goods, produce, and manufacture are to be admitted free, that means what it says. And moreover, and Ian didn't get into this in, in his presentation, but the prior incarnations of this clause said free from duty. So what really happened? How did the phrase of duty get removed? The intention of our fathers of confederation was to expand the clause, to broaden it by removing the phrase of duty. But how did that come about? You have to appreciate a little bit of the historical context. During the trial, uh, Ian and I brought in one of the world's leading experts on the constitutional moment in Canada, the years between 1864 and 1867 when the constitutional debates were ongoing. His name, Professor Andrew Smith of the University of Liverpool. And he came, and, 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 and I tell you, I didn't like history in high school, but anybody present during Mr. Uh, Professor Smith's vivid testimony would have had a totally different idea about how immediate and how uh, illustrative an historical context can be. And Andrew told us, and, and, and an engrossed courtroom and, and media, how President Lincoln had determined in about 1864, along with Congress, that the free trade that had been hard earned between Canada and the US was not sitting well with the Americans. But they were not prepared to out and outright abrogate the treaty. So instead, what the Americans did in about 1864, 1865, is they adopted what we now refer as non-tariff barriers. They created protocols that we now call search and detain. So, so there, there's no tariff. There's no duty. However, if you're uh, a, a greengrocer taking your lettuce from Quebec to Boston, don't expect it to get there before it goes back. You're going to be detained at the border. Gee, you should have thought about that, the Americans said. So the Canadians, or the British North Americans as they then were, were devastated. And they asked Britain to intercede. And Britain went to Washington and tried to talk some sense into the Americans and got absolutely nowhere. So when the precursor of our BNA went uh, for enactment to London, the British were very, very sensitive to the issues Canadians were facing regarding the rise of non-tariff trade barriers. And that's why the phrase of duty was removed, because the Committee of the Whole of the British House of Lords wanted to express this shackle upon both federal and provincial governments, the shackle that would prevent both tariff and non-tariff trade barriers in moving goods, produce, and manufacture from one province to another. That was the original intention. That was the historical context in which Section 121 took place. I, I, I want to talk for a few moments about the challenges involved in attacking liquor regulators in Canada. I didn't choose to be a liquor lawyer. I'm sure most lawyers in this room didn't choose their specialities either. They sort of chose you. What happened with me is I was a young lawyer in 1993 starting my own practice and I was introduced to a dynamic young entrepreneur named Gabe Magnotta. Uh, many Ontarians in this room are probably familiar with Magnotta Wines and you may recall back in the 90s the fight to the death in which Magnotta was engaged with the Liquor Control Board of Ontario because as Magnata's lawyer, I had figured out a way for Magnata to self-distribute its wines at multiple locations and make money outside of the LCBO system, which never should have happened, but it was totally legal. So the LCBO started to pass a series of increasingly hostile regulations and policies that appeared to be of general application, but in point of fact, they applied to only one company, Magnata. I spent the better part of 17 years fighting the LCBO. 
And I want you to understand what you're up against. First of all, I've never engaged a liquor regulator in court where I haven't heard two arguments, both of which are utterly fallacious, but here they are. One argument I call the MRI argument. It goes something like this. I write a big check to the provincial government and they use it to do good things in our community like buy MRI machines, so let me do whatever I want to make money. The ends justify the means. Well, of course they don't, but I always hear that argument. The second argument I hear, I call it the sky is falling argument. And it, it's, it's sort of like jumps and springboards upon the MRI argument and says, if you don't let us do whatever we want to do to raise revenue, uh, well, the sky will fall. We'll have bootlegging. We'll have illegal liquor. We'll have uh, uh, scurrilous criminals making money <laughs> by selling liquor. Or, or actually, the worst part of all is we're not going to be able to write the provincial government as big a check anymore. <laughs> that gets their attention every time. So the reality is that our liquor boards are beholden to no one. They're not beholden to the voters. They're not beholden to their shoppers. They are beholden only to the provincial legislature to which they have to report. And as long as they're writing that check, for the most part, they are permitted to do whatever they want. Now, liquor revenues, every single province of this country are the third largest source of revenue. Number one, taxes. Number two, user fees. Number three, booze. There isn't a province that can balance their books without the way the liquor regulatory system is structured now. Hence, we have these MRI type arguments. At least this is what we continually hear from the liquor regulators. However, and going back to the Como trial, what came out is that the situation is dramatically different. Here in Canada, we have something called the Agreement on Internal Trade, and it's somewhat flawed. But one thing it does is it purports to allow limited amounts of liquor to be personally taken from one province to another. A principle that was formally enacted federally in Bill C-311. But that is also flawed, because what the feds did is they set up this permission, but they left it to each of the provinces to determine for themselves how much liquor they're going to allow an individual to bring into their borders. And all the provinces behave differently. Uh, Manitoba said, you can bring in as much as you want. The maritime provinces didn't change a thing. And Ontario and BC said we haven't been enforcing it then and for the most part we're not going to enforce it now. So again, what we have is an inconsistent patchwork quilt of different practices, policies and procedures for liquor in Canada. And not even the highfalutin attempt to allow an individual to personally take liquor from one province into another has really been, been manifested in any practical way. So as a, as a litigator, you ask yourself, if you're dealing with an adversary with unlimited power, unlimited money, and they will spend whatever they need to spend because you are perceived as attacking a provincial government's means to control their own economy. So they're going to resist with everything they have. So how can you fight them if they're impervious to financial damage? How can you fight them if they're impervious to public disapproval? Well, one thing they're not impervious to is judicial disapproval. And that's one of the things that we're privileged to do as lawyers is bundle these facts and argue them in court to a receptive judge who may conclude that this is an instance of regulatory overreach, excess of jurisdiction, or impropriety. I'll tell you a very quick little story before I, I pass on to Ron. This is how I came to learn about the liquor board's Achilles heel. Going back to the Magnata case, we started with approximately 17 issues and ended up with over 44 issues. Now on judicial reviews, as the lawyers in the room know, you're dealing with a paper record. Also as the lawyers in the room know, judicial review is a discretionary remedy. In other words, you could be right about everything and the judge could still, as a matter of discretion, decline to give you relief for, for whatever reason 
within the scope of the permissibility of that discretion. So, so given that constraint, 44 issues, how can I possibly convince the divisional court to use their discretion to give me relief when the issues have become so complicated and intertwined that resolving them on a paper record is going to prove extremely challenging. So what do I do? I move for a trial, which you're allowed to do under the Judicial Review Procedure Act. So I move before a three-judge panel of the Divisional Court to have my application converted into a trial. And I'm arguing all day long, and I'm alone in my part of the courtroom. And on the other side of the courtroom, there's the liquor board's lawyers. They have three partners from a downtown firm, and three juniors, and three associates, and three paralegals, and five civil <laughs> servants in the body of the courtroom. And there I am, arguing all day long, sweating. I do my best sweating in my robes. And one judge is with me, and the other judge is against me, and the judge in the middle is asleep. <laughs> and he's nodding. <laughs> and I'm, I'm making an argument about a particular piece of LCBO subterfuge. I'll spare you that part of the story. But when I get to the punchline, I hold up my record and I say, Your Honors, and they said, No one can do this but themselves. And the, the judge in the middle woke up. And, and he started to shake. <laughs> That's just reprehensible, <laughs> he says. That's just reprehensible. And I look over and I see my opponents on the other side of the courtroom, and this is the only time in years where I've actually seen them look really sick. They looked sick. And it dawned on me that the only way to impress your point upon the nature of an opponent like this is to get them to the threshold of the court, get them into the body of the court, marshal your facts, argue it with the law, and convince the judge that the liquor board is offside. And if you can do that, especially in the context of what we're trying to achieve with Section 121 of the Constitution Act, and have that properly interpreted to reframe the economic foundation of, of, of our country. If you can do that, you can make a difference, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you both, and um, I will start the discussion with some questions, and then we will open the floor at the end to, uh, to more questions, which I will sh I'm sure will come. My first one is actually a quote from John Maynard Keynes, who may not be as popular in, in this room. Um, <laughs> but he did, a, he did make a correct observation once. And he said, uh, uh, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. The reason I'm quoting this is I'm interested in generally the intellectual climate on the question of free trade around confederation. You, you've, you've mentioned uh, some of the historical background and, and the issues Canadians or British North Americans were having exporting to the United States, but I'm interested more generally in, in the intellectual climate. Uh, were the, the founding fathers and, and, and their generation uh, you know, committed to free trade or, or, or was it the generation committed to protectionism and barriers? At the time of um, <coughs> Confederation, Canada had negotiated, or Britain on Canada's behalf, had negotiated the Reciprocity Treaty of 1854. Um, that gave, uh, uh, with America, and that gave uh, Canada, the Canadian provinces, essential free trade with the United States. That had followed the 1849 so-called repeal of the Corn Laws in um, the uh, UK, which had gave them free trade, and the US Congress also had passed free trade in 1848. So what happened was, during the American Civil War, uh, Britain did certain acts considered hostile to the United States, namely allowing Confederate warships to be built in British shipyards. And um, for that reason, President Lincoln, as Arne has alluded to, announced in the State of Union Address in 1864 that he was going to is, uh, commence these, the um, 
detain and search provisions and other non-tariff -trade, non trade barriers. This was at the same time discussion about um, Confederation was going on. Canadians were very upset about the loss of the Reciprocity Treaty. So the discussion in the Confederation debates were let's create an economic union to replace the U.S. market and let's uh, have complete free trade. And they were, uh, fathers of Confederation were astutely aware of non-tariff trade barriers. They chose their words very carefully. So the world at the time was free trade. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the economic, that was the economic leap motif around the world. And that's what they were trying to create in Canada. That, so that, that, that was the intellectual basis for the provision, which um, being placed where it was in part eight was a restriction on both federal powers and on provincial powers. The, um, we all know that uh, after that, Sir John A's national policy um, started to attenuate the free trade um, aspects, and uh, you ha we have to accept that, but that, that was the reason for the provision. Mm -hmm. Moreover, when the BNA Act went to the British House of Lords uh, uh, to be uh, uh, promulgated, uh, the mood at Britain at the time was predominantly free trade. In fact, it was such uh, important political uh, uh, agenda. It was almost political dogma. It was, it was bicameral. It was bilateral. Everyone in Great Britain, uh, no matter what your socioeconomic <coughs> class, supported the concept of free trade at that time. I just wanted to make another point. The gold seal case, which I mentioned, um, with great respect to my brethren in the profession, the hardest thing to get any lawyer to do is think about something twice. <laughs> um, and at that time, decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada by the rule of stare decisis were binding, and no one questioned them. So gold seal was considered immutable law. At the time of 1981, when we were, going, when we were uh, having the discussions about um, amending the Constitution and bringing home the Constitution, a lot of law professors wrote papers uh, um, about how Section 121 should be amended to improve free trade, and they did that without looking any, doing any legal analysis about whether that was needed or not, or about the Gold Seal case. So um, there, there are numerous papers out there by respected legal scholars about Section 121, none of which look, goes behind the gold seal judgment. And, we're, and, that, and that's affected the, intellect, the intellectual climate of today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> uh, and then, so jumping forward, and I'll quote from, from Ian's paper, uh, he says, it seems inescapable that to date the Supreme Court has essentially ignored the terms and intent and the purpose of Section 121. And as a result, Canadians have lived with and had to pay for entrenched federal marketing schemes a purpose of interpretation of Section 121 would never have permitted. Sadly, the losers in the subordination of the Constitution are the excluded Canadian producers and consumers and taxpayers. And I was wondering if you could expand on uh, the impacts of the current interpretation of Section 121, um, and in particular, you know, in, in the liquor sphere, but also beyond the liquor sphere, surely they, they affect uh, various areas of the economy, and, and who pays the price? Yeah, Section 121, the argument that we make here in the beer context, <coughs> is obviously much broader. Uh, it applied to the old Canadian Wheat Board when it was there. It applies to all the marketing schemes for eggs and poultry in the province. Mm -hmm. It applies to almost any scheme to benefit one segment of the province um, at the expense of the other, or to regulate trade among provinces. I know that there are very big arguments about why that is a good thing, why it is good to regulate trade in the interests of the, the general public, but it is all contrary, uh, I would argue, to a proper interpretation of Section 121. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Moving on, so the, the, the gold seal decision, um, wrong as that may be, was decided in 1921. So, uh, but it still continues to do dominate jurisprudence. You've alluded earlier to a series of decisions following it, but I was wondering if, if you could uh, explain uh, 
um, how it's been interpreted uh, over the years, um, whether the Supreme Court has turned to the question uh, again, and, and whether it's varied its conclusions in, in Gold Seal. Well, it was first considered in Atlantic Smoke Shops, 1943, by Viscount Simon. Um, Viscount Simon simply said that Section 121 had had a full um, elaboration in the Gold Seal case, and he didn't need to do anything <coughs> except follow it. That's nonsense. Uh, if you read uh, the Gold Seal case, it was not a full judicial elaboration. Viscount Simon was just another British politician um, who had um, uh, spent a lot of work time in India. His only experience for Canada was one speech to the uh, Canadian Bar Association on the same topic of uh, lawyers having courage. And um, <laughs> he was in uh, Neville Chamberlain's appeasement uh, cabinet in Winston Churchill when he became Prime Minister in May 40, bumped him into the House of Lords. So that was Viscount Simon. Uh, it came up in Murphy versus CPR. Um, and in um, Mr. Justice Rand in Murphy versus CPR said that the gold seal interpretation was too narrow and he wanted um, a broader interpretation and he basically gave the interpretation that I have described. The majority judges um, followed gold seal. It came up finally in 1974 in the Agricultural Products Marketing Act. Mr. Justice Laskin um, um, considered it, he considered Rand's purpose of decision, but basically um, Mr. Justice Laskin's level of analysis was, I'm the judge, what I say is the law, and I say that uh, this marketing scheme benefiting one area of the country <coughs> um, with the assistance of others is not a violation of 121. Well, that's fine, but those aren't the norms we use to interpret provisions of the Constitution today. That was, I'm the judge, uh, I'm making the decision, and that's my decision. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, not, it's not very judicial. Um, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one other thing I would say, Arnie and I have a case uh, no, against I should add to, in, in none of these In none of these cases that considered gold seal, uh, was the duff letter ever made manifest? No, no, that, 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 that was that, my that, next that, question. That, is, that, <laughs> that duff letter is revelatory, and it, it wasn't until the Como case mm -hmm. that it's been tendered into evidence. And I was able to get it into evidence because I had the certification mm -hmm. of the Librarian of Canada mm -hmm. that, that made it prima facie admissible under the Canada Evidence Act. And so it creates an air of corruption, or at least impropriety over the decision. Um, it casts a cloud over the, the propriety and correctness of the decision, yes. And, and, but there's no doctrine that would allow you to invalidate a decision on, on the basis of, of it. Like, so what, what did you, what did it go to? In the, Co so, in the Como mm -hmm. case, it is an exhibit in the case. Mm -hmm. And as Mr. Justice Stratus said last night, if the court's going to accept the record of the court below, it's there and it's evidence it has to deal with. Mm -hmm. And is the Supreme Court of Canada today going to say, hey, it's all right for us to have lunch with the Minister of the Justice and tell him how the case is going to go? Uh, no, he's not. So are, are they going to say that was a judicial decision? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. They may come to the same conclusion for other um, sneaky reasons, but they won't do it for those reasons. The, the other point I was going to make about the, um, the argument uh, that Gold Seal is wrong, in a case that Arnie and I are doing against the LCBO, which uh, one of the rare ones we won against uh, liquor regulators, um, the, uh, the um, LCBO said that our position would violate the Importation of Intoxicating Liquors Act, among other acts. We put in a constitutional notice in which we um, raised this argument. They withdrew the allegation after we put the notice in. So they obviously know about it, and they're a little bit nervous of it. Thank you. Um, and, and still on sort of the impact of, of Gold Seal, um, Ian, you've written that bearing in mind that constitutional interpretation is discretionary and often political, and we've been discussing this throughout this conference, um, if one of these schemes were challenged based on arguments similar to those that you've offered in your articles, uh, would the Supreme Court be prepared to declare the scheme unconstitutional um, 
if that is where a purpose of interpretation of Section 121 would take it. Uh, and you said, these are the questions that can only be answered next time 121 comes before the Supreme Court. And of course, Como is, seems to be the case where it, it will, it may, or <coughs> it's likely, it likely will come to the Supreme Court. So I, I would like to speak more about Como. So perhaps you could tell us more. You've, you've established the players. Uh, you know, but we would like to hear more about the arguments, the evidence, you know, anything you can tell us about sure, how it went. Well, I guess a little bit about the timeline. Um, uh, Justice LeBlanc, uh, the uh, provincial court judge who's hearing uh, the case, I indicated to us that he's intending to rule in April. Uh, we have an agreement with the New Brunswick Attorney General uh, that regardless of the outcome, we know the next stage is, is going to be an appeal. Ordinarily, under the New Brunswick rules, it would go to the uh, Superior Court. Uh, there is a means to bypass that step. So it will go directly to the New Brunswick Court of Appeal, where we expect to argue it probably at the end of 2015. And again, regardless of the outcome, we fully expect this is going to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. And for once, this is not a matter on which I'm particularly concerned of getting leave. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that if it does go down that road, um, leave, leave will go. I think the uh, greater challenge is convincing the Supreme Court to revisit uh, Gold Seal and providing them with abundant reasons why they should depart uh, from that decision in 1921. So, Ron, if, if you'd give me a, a specific question about, uh, about well, some uh, of the so, so I want I want to focus my sure. answer. Sure. Let's perhaps set out the the arguments, uh, in particular the arguments you you've had to face on the other side, and you know sort of the, the major strands in, in um, why you know w what were they um, arguing Section 121 stands for, and 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 how did you counter it? And you've alluded to some expert evidence. Perhaps you could you could talk about the expert evidence as well. Do you want to take a stab at that first? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, the basic argument that the um, provincial government makes, and we suspect that New Brunswick had help on this from Ontario, is this. Under the division of powers, um, a lot of the trade barriers that um, were problems have been dealt with. Bills of exchange, criminal law, different, different state weights and measures, all those, all those things have been given to the federal government. They say that under Section 92, provincial governments were given broad powers to develop their own economies independently of each other and of the federal government. They say a robust interpretation of Section 121 of the type that um, a purposeful interpretation would result in would be inimical to that division of powers. So uh, maybe the gold seal interpretation isn't perfect, but it has allowed provinces to develop with a minimum of uh, interprovincial conflict, or there'd be a lot more if Section 121 was imposed. That's not a bad argument. That, that's the one that I hear the Supreme Court of Canada and um, its law clerks and legal advisors working up. But um, it's really, it's really, um, requires the uh, Supreme Court to say a provision in the Constitution shouldn't get a purposeful interpretation uh, to say a provision of the Constitution should be, should be, should be ignored um, in order to meet provincial objectives. And I don't think that's the way the Constitution was designed. And the second fundamental argument that the Crown advanced was that Section 121 has, for all intents and purposes, fallen into disuse and the, um, the legalism that they used was desuetude. I thought I had a good vocabulary, but I actually had to look that one up when I saw it in their brief. Desuetude. Uh, so they actually produced an expert, a political scientist, who talked about from his perspective why Section 121 had fallen into disuse and uh, thereby could not, uh, uh, could not be referenced uh, in order to uh, 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 strike out the charging statute that had Mr. Como um, fixed with being a, a provincial offense. Um, however, when I cross-examined that particular expert, he admitted that no court had ever found uh, that the section had fallen into uh, disuse and uh, functionally agreed with me that the end doesn't 
justify the means and that the provincial government's desire uh, to enhance their provincial revenues through uh, uh, strengthened liquor laws um, did not really justify um, the means if those means were unconstitutional under Section 121. Well, yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously for your client, you, you want him to be acquitted. But broadly speaking, um, what are your hopes for the impact of, of the outcome um, of the Como uh, case if you're successful? So broadly speaking, what do you hope to see in terms of liquor regulation in Canada? H how, would you, how would you hope that it would be structured going forward? Uh, and, and, you know, for interprovincial trade more generally? Well, let me ask, uh, answer that question in terms of liquor law, which, which sure. is an area with which I'm comfortable. I'm not a trade lawyer, generally speaking. Um, I, I referred earlier to Bill C-311. Bill C-311 was a private member's bill. Some of you have probably heard of this, allowing for personal portage of uh, some quantities of liquor across provincial borders. There's actually a very interesting genesis uh, to that bill. Back in, I guess it was what, about 2002, maybe 2003? Ian and I gave an address to the. Uh, 2008. Was it that? 2009. Was it that late? Yeah. We gave an address to, um, uh, to the BC Wine Expo uh, that takes place annually in Vancouver. And uh, we were at that time addressing the fact that the BC liquor regulator had informed various wineries that were selling wine to neighboring provinces through their websites, that if they continued to do so, they were afoul of federal legislation, and the BC liquor regulator would take away their <coughs> manufacturing license. Well, naturally, that scared the heck out of the wineries, and it, it forced them in line. But they complained, and those political complaints led to what might formulate Bill's bill 311, the loosening of these restrictions. And I gave a pointed address at that, at, that, um, at that event saying, why would we want to accept a loosening of the dog collar that we shouldn't have to wear in the first place? How Canadian of us. <laughs> so Bill 311 was passed. Mm -hmm. So you ask, what does this case mean in terms of a liquor law application? Right. Mm -hmm. If this case succeeds, then we won't be wearing that collar. It means you can go to downtown Toronto and have BC wine Not for supper. We have to knock out the section three of the IILA first. Well, that will logically flow. It will all flow. Mm -hmm. If section 121 <laughs> falls, there's going to be a number of defined primary consequences, secondary tertiary consequences. It's difficult to say to what extent this will play out, but it's certainly arguable that even the egg marketing boards, the dairy marketing boards, the chicken marketing boards will all ultimately be affected. I mean, why is not we can't buy a, a Quebec chicken in Ontario? Uh, that question will also be affected. I think at the end of the day that uh, the remounting of what was originally supposed to be the power of Section 121 will create a more harmonious and prosperous country economically. And finally, going mm -hmm. back, Ron, to your question about some of the expert testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Andrew Smith described for us when we had free trade with the Americans in the 1815s and the 1860s, free trade of a, of, a, of a manner that is even more profound than what we enjoy today with the Americans. It was true free trade in every sense. How when it appeared to be coming to an end uh, that the fathers of confederation were, were literally in a panic. Professor Smith described these two decades as the most prosperous decades in the history of our country. He said, we were building railroads, we were opening banks, we were creating infrastructure to use Trudeau's words. So our hope is that by uh, bringing the power back into Section 121 as it was originally conceived uh, by our fathers of confederation, that we will create a more harmonious uh, and prosperous domestic economy. Mm -hmm. And that, that ties, I have a, a follow-up question on that. You've mentioned the sky is falling argument, and it's often made, but it's never actually been um, supported with evidence in, in any kind of uh, judicial 
in, in the determination, right? Right, it's you are, Ron. On the contrary, in fact, during the trial, I introduced evidence from Statistics Canada showing that when Manitoba determined uh, further to Bill C-311 and the Agreement on Internal Trade, that it will allow unlimited amounts of liquor to be brought into its, its province. Um, its revenues actually went up <laughs> consistently and statistically significantly. So in fact, the evidence mm -hmm. is the sky will not fall. Right, that free trade would lead to prosperity. That free trade then. leads to increased prosperity. Perhaps that's a good point to conclude and let's open the floor to questions. This might be kind of a softball question, but uh, as you may know, and that's kind of a joke, uh, may know in Alberta, our government has recently brought in a, a protectionist beer tax. So now if I want to purchase beer from Quebec in, in Alberta, they charge me more. And it's particular to those breweries that are outside New West Partnership. And is that something that Gold Seal and Section 121 would talk to? Well, uh, <clears throat> on that, on that uh, beer tax, we've had a, at least I've had a look at it, and I'm convinced that uh, that beer tax would violate even the gold seal decision because it's effectively a tax at the border. Uh, certainly, for the same reasons that I talked about, would violate Section 121. Ernie, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. It, it, uh, we advise the affected Alberta brewers that, comparatively speaking, because the beer case is so familiar to many Canadians now because of the media it, it, it attracted. It's comparatively an easier case than the Como case. Um, what it is specifically is if you are an out-of-province craft brewer, you are going to pay a lot more money to get your product into the province. It does not affect craft brewers uh, of the Western Partnership. It does not affect the major brewers. It only affects brewers of a size like a Moosehead or a Muskoka Brewery or uh, uh, a Steam Whistle uh, would be another example. And craft brewers is skunky Alberta beer. <laughs> so, so it's not only discriminatory on a trade level, it's also discriminatory within the beer industry because it creates winners and losers. Does that help? As another Albertan, we can't even drink our sorrows away anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I was actually going to uh, touch on something you mentioned towards the end there, where um, if you win, how wide-ranging is this? Could the judge rule that this eliminates any of these barriers? Or could they also, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how this would work, could they also rule it very narrow and say this only applies to beer or wine the or liquor? The judge is going to rule as it applies to that charging section of the New Brunswick Liquor Control Act only. That's all he's going to do. That's all the Court of Appeal will do. And but that's the all the Supreme Court, Court, Court of okay. Canada will do. The consequences of establishing a doctrinal rewrite, if we're successful in doing that, that will be left for uh, the next generation of lawyers and judges to argue out. But uh, I've, I've had to answer a lot of media on that very question and to make the answer easy to understand and, and, and what I've said is none of these courts are going to tell us the scope of consequences. They're not going to tell us how to deal with the consequences. So uh, I, I would ask you, Mr. or Madam Reporter, let this be a message to our politicians. Let our politicians get on notice. We are going to have freer trade in Canada. It is going to happen. Hopefully this case will be one of the major uh, means of leverage by which that's going to happen. But make no mistake, that's where we're going. So our politicians, don't leave us in the lurch, please. Start planning for when the courts tell us that these unconstitutional interprovincial trade barriers must fall. So j just to clarify, e each of those other things you talked about, like the wheat board and things like that, would have to be dealt with in separate cases but you now have a precedent that should make those cases easier? Yes, right. okay. the, writings, the writing's on the wall. Politicians, do your job, please. As Mr. Justice Stratus said last evening, governments have lawyers, they read the, they read the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, they can see which way the wind is blowing legally. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, this really follows along um, from Peter's question. Um, sometime within the past year, I was writing an op-ed in support of the, the, the Como case, and as a result of that, had one or two uh, radio interviews. And I did say, um, you know, this should affect the egg marketing boards and so on. And I had a call on the phone from someone who introduced himself as some kind of official in the Canadian Egg Marketing Agency. <laughs> and he insisted that, um, that, you know, the beer case would have nothing whatsoever to do with the egg marketing, that, um, that the whole egg marketing scheme um, was not a trade was not an interprovincial trade barrier and had already been decided in Richardson uh, years ago anyhow so I just want you to know that they're already gearing up for the for the battle good <laughs> <laughs> um, for either Arnold or Ian is there any role for the federal attorney general the federal government in these cases to take a position and if so have they or any interest at all at the DOJ but we, we filed a notice of constitutional question, um, as did the Crown, and we get the usual letter, um, we'll be taking no uh, position on this. If it gets to, I think by the time it gets to the New Brunswick Court of Appeal, we'll see, we'll start seeing the Provincial Attorney General, but not the Federal Attorney General. When we get to the Supreme Court of Canada, we'll see them both. It wouldn't be surprising to, to find that the Attorneys General of every province belly up to that bar. We're, we're expecting it. There's um, billions and billions of dollars annually at stake. What about the LCBO? Do you think they might show up for that? Absolutely no question about it. The LCBO's check to the Ontario government is up to about $1.67 billion a year. And they, they are the richest, most powerful company in Canada. And they want to get the <laughs> and, and just to follow up on that, do you, do you, do you two think there's a role for the federal, gov for the re for our federal government with the right inclination to take a leadership role in these cases with no question and in, in, in fact that's a really good question because we were all surprised at the extent of, of media coverage on this case we were all taken a, a, a little bit a little bit aback in fact I was gobsmacked to, to not put too fine a point on it um, there were over 1800 publications in Canada about this case and I know that a journalist took it up on the campaign trail and it actually became a note a repeated note uh, during the uh, federal election campaigns. Um, uh, uh, from Prime Minister Harper was asked, what's your government's position on the interprovincial trade barriers affecting the cross-provincial uh, uh, movement of liquor? He had two words. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, the next day, Justin Trudeau chimed in and he said, yes, we think it's ridiculous too, but it's Harper's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, hold your breath hoping the federal government is going to take a leadership position on this. Uh, if there was any government, federal government that should have, it would have been, it would have been the Harper Conservatives uh, because a lot of their MPs were very vocal about um, the restrictions in their provincial movement of even liquor. And, um, but uh, <clears throat> they're political animals and too many provinces have too many um, provincial protections in place uh, to um, for the federal government to want to, to, to want to get into that. 